Praise be Jesus, Samaria. In today's readings, there are several passages which one could tie into these readings in the gospel to help us to understand and to emphasize what our Lord in today's gospel teaches us. The rich man is not actually accused of any actual sin aside from the fact that he just had no regard of the poor man Lazarus. It's interesting, too, that our Lord doesn't really give a name. Tradition gives a name to him, but... uh, in the gospel, the rich man has no name. He's unnamed. And everything, as it were, our Lord turns everything upside down from what this we see in this world happens. Everybody knows the name of the rich man. We can think of any number of rich men that pop into our heads. We know their, Everybody knows their name. In heaven, who is known? It's the poor man. God knows the poor man. And as soon as the poor man is introduced into the gospel, the poor man is instantly given a name. And he says... And at the door was a poor man named Lazarus. Whereas there is no name for the rich man. It just says the rich man. That's it. Simple. Except that he's dressed in purple garments and eats sumptuously every day. But otherwise he's unnamed. Before God he's a nobody. And yet in this life we find out it's not necessarily really. The rich man's not condemned. It's something St. Augustine points out. I actually I'll read a little bit from St. Augustine couple of passages. He puts it very nicely. Lazarus was received into heaven because of his humility, not because of his poverty. Wealth itself was not what kept the rich man from eternal bliss. His punishment was for his selfishness and disloyalty. Our Lord would tell you if you, if you read the dialogues of St. Catherine of Siena, our Lord actually goes over quite a bit uh, in one of the sections there on how the rich actually hold in their very hands the means by which, if you'll let me use the term, by which they can purchase heaven. So, well, wait a minute, you can't buy heaven. No, it's true. But our Lord does tell us how. He tells the rich man, remember the rich, rich young man who also doesn't have a name. <laughs> the rich young man whom our Lord says, you know, go sell what you have and give to the poor and you shall have treasure in heaven. Well, already implies eternal life. He's just told them how to purchase eternal life. Our Lord explained to St. Catherine of Siena, those who are wealthy, those who are rich, and we can take it, I like to expand the horizons, because it doesn't just mean, you know, the fact that you've got material wealth and lots of, you know, gizmos and gadgets. It can also be our talents. Sometimes people are very gifted and talented, but to share our gifts and talents with one another, and so far as we're able. And we do have to, you know, the charity starts at home. We don't want to, you know, taking care of everybody outside of the home. We forget the home, the home's a wreck. I mean, that's an that's important aspect of charity. Sometimes, though, I can tell you this from the religious point of view, sometimes the Lord withholds, you know, our means, you know, to sustain ourselves because we don't lend a hand when we could. We don't reach out and offering helping hand when we really could. Sometimes even an expense to oneself. I remember experiencing that in, in Australia. One of our friars, <clears throat> not because we were being necessarily stringy, but sometimes maybe we're just not mindful. And when we start getting th- things start, start getting tight, I usually start thinking about being more generous. <laughs> it's like, hmm, maybe the Lord's trying to make a point here. Maybe there's a purpose to this poverty. <laughs> there is a purpose. I mean, it's partly we're supposed to live poverty. But sometimes it's like, well, they're a little tighter than what's normal. And sometimes it means, well, you just have to help out someplace else. And all of a sudden, divine providence provides in other ways. It's like something that we weren't even looking or for or expecting. It just shows up. And I've had it happen a number of times in my own religious life. And I'm like, well, you know, it's hard to say it's just accidental. <laughs> hard to say providence isn't providing here. You know, both in the instruction and trying to say, yeah, this is, Part of what we're supposed to do. Not, not just religious. I'm talking all of us. It may very well be that sometimes we find ourselves in difficulties. You know, exasperated in, at the end of our tether because there's a lack of generosity to help out in a way that I could. And it, it may not, you know, in some areas you may be quite all right. In other areas, areas where you may be suffering, maybe it's simple. That's an area where the Lord is trying to say, I want you to be more generous. I want you to reach out and help in this place where you could. 
So it's not because the rich man is rich. It's because he didn't have the time of day or notice a man in need. And this is part of what sometimes is, I like to just simply call it um, charity, but a lot of times it's also, you know, the popes are using terms like solidarity, trying to use the terms which people are very much philanthropy. <laughs> Everybody thinks that uh, Mother, Mother Teresa, is a, she's a great philanthropist. <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's, in a, she's a contemplative, at, you know, at work in the world. <laughs> In fact, if she doesn't see Christ in her neighbor, one of the beautiful things when one man asked Mother Teresa, you know, why are you doing this for me? He wasn't even Christian or Catholic. And she simply told him, because I recognize Jesus in you. And this is what our Lord talks about in Matthew. You know, at one point, not in today's gospel, but, you know, he talks about the separation of the goat and the sheep. Those people and the separation of the goat and sheep, it's just like today's gospel. They're not sent to hell for anything they didn't, you know, it's not like they committed sins against the Tenth Commandment or the Ten Commandments necessarily. They just didn't help their brother when they could have. It's not enough, as St. James tells us, it's not enough to say, you know, be, keep warm and keep well fed, you know, and wishing our, your brother well. This is not enough. Meanwhile, he's naked and starving. <laughs> Why aren't you all nice? <laughs> Just put your, you know, put the shoe on the other foot. What if it's you? How would you like someone to, you're naked, cold, and freezing, and hungry, and someone comes up to you and says, keep warm and well fed. You think, you idiot. <laughs> you're, you're a doofus. <laughs> what a crazy, and you trying to call yourself a Catholic? <laughs> what do you think you are? We oftentimes don't recognize, if we flip it around and put it on a very practical basis, if it's regarding ourselves, light, the light is crystal clear. But sometimes we're blind. Well, we're looking at our brother's suffering. We have to open our eyes to the brothers and sisters, our brothers and sisters in need. At the same time, it doesn't mean that you have to forget the home front. As I said, charity does begin at home, but sometimes even our Lord, you know, when he talks about the poor and he's encouraging the poor to even to be generous, he says, even from our poverty, we should give a little. You know, our Lord recognizes that sometimes we may very much be in, in poverty, but yet... Look at the great praise he gave to the widow who gave it two mites. We can be certain that she is not, and we know she's eternally receiving God, Christ's praise. Every time that gospel is read at the Mass, she is receiving her due praise. And for all eternity, she will receive her praise for the generosity and faith that she showed in giving her two mites, all that she possessed, all that she had. And yet God's not calling us, this is all of us necessarily, to that type of generosity, but to be mindful of one another. What our Lord further goes on to say in this gospel, we recognize the whole dialogue once the rich man gets to, to the other side of this world, to the next life, he starts realizing that, you know, we put too much you know, into this world and we don't recognize better to have a little injustice, the poor man Lazarus, to get to heaven than to have much and find oneself in hell because all that one seemed to have will be lost. That's what our Lord tells us. What you even, what they think they possess, they will lose even that because they are truly actually poor. It's one of the reasons why we have to have pity on those who don't recognize Christ and don't have our faith. It's one of the things that we need to have and ask our Lord to help us to grow in our faith and trust in him. And yet, once we get to heaven, there's no helping out the poor man. It's not a matter of not noticing the poor man anymore. He can't be helped. So as Abraham points out, there's a gulf. There's no way to cross from one side to the other. There's no way to offer any aid to those who have chosen to separate themselves from Christ because they've really chosen that. They've separated themselves from that help. They don't want it. They didn't want it, and they didn't care. Ultimately, we do find out, our Lord does tell us, it's actually denial of himself. Because we haven't had a regard, if you want to put it in the, the most precious way we can, we haven't had a regard for the blood of Christ. Why do we have to have a love for the, especially for the one we dislike the most? Because Christ shed his blood for that person. Now you say you can't stand them, but yet Christ shed his blood. If you love Christ and you have any value for the blood of Christ and what he suffered, not only for you, but for the one that you don't like most, then you begin in a little bit, a little way, to understand 
how we have to love our brother, even though we may not like him, whoever it may be. We also know that, and our Lord actually proves this point, point. I do like this because I haven't ever heard a commentator make it, but I'm sure there's some father of the church that draws this out. Our Lord actually wants to take this example, this parable, and he actually turns it into real life because we know that there was a Lazarus, although he wasn't necessarily a poor man, but perhaps he was poor in the spirit of poverty. You know, he was detached, I'm sure, from the things of this world because we know that, you know, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were all very, uh, well, they were well-to-do, but they were very pious, very holy, and following our Lord around. And yet we know that Lazarus would die, and our Lord, the very words that our Lord spoke here, you know, even if one should be risen from the dead, Lazarus was raised from the dead, what does the gospel tell us? They wanted to kill him too. <laughs> because many were coming to believe in our Lord because of Lazarus. So our Lord has really, he's done everything he possibly can to convince us that we need to do what he's asked us to do, to keep his commandments, to keep his words, pondering them in our heart and living them in our life. And yet even if, we're, if we won't open our hearts and our minds to the gospel, striving to live the truth as we come to know it, and I say that on purpose because you know, none of us here has the fullness or understands even close to, even a small part of the truth of the gospel. It's something that as we deepen our unity with Christ through suffering, that we're given the light to understand the gospels. And I tell you, the people that I've met who suffer and they unite their sufferings to Christ, they themselves are the ones who I have often find appreciate and understand the gospel far better than the rich men of this world. And sometimes, you know, you can talk to your blue in the face and, and the rich man, just, he just they just don't get it. They don't understand. And yet again and again, I find, you know, poor people who do get the picture. You know, they're pious, poor people. They do pray. They do their best, you know, and they're getting knocked left and right. And sometimes you go, why, Lord? <laughs> well, it has to happen. I've mentioned this too. Why does, why does it have to happen? Well, you have to suffer one place or the other. And you've chosen the better place to suffer because here you can deepen your love. You can grow in merit. You can grow in virtue. But once you get to the next life, we're in purgatory. I know we continue to suffer in purgatory. But if we die in God's grace after purgatory, there is no more suffering. There's no more place that we can make amends to God. The suffering is over. So if you have to choose a place to suffer, well, I mean, don't aim for purgatory. Many people say that. If you aim for purgatory and you miss, guess where you're going, okay? Aim for heaven. So if you miss, hopefully, God willing, you'll hit purgatory. Always aim higher. And so if you aim to be the greatest saint, you might actually, you know, come into heaven, you know, by the skin of your teeth and get even just the lowest place. Um, that in itself is already better because you at least didn't have to go through purgatory. But let us hope and trust in the Lord. Even though we may suffer for a time in this life, we know that it's to our, greatly to our profit. Asking him to trust, trust in his divine providence, trust in his permissive will when people cause us to suffer, either through their own sins or negligence or lack of caring about us, about others. But let us, in our, even in our poverty and our difficulties, offer what aid and help we can for the love of Christ. May our Blessed Mother inspire us and intercede for us, she who in our poverty would win from the Father our salvation by obtaining her for us her Son and offering that beloved Son on Calvary for our salvation, paying a painful price of our sins. May the generosity of Jesus and Mary inspire us to help one another and to love one another. Praise be Jesus and Mary.